This is our continuing series on 10 myths about the bar exam. And for the last few weeks and few messages, I've been looking at some of the things that people erroneously believe about the test and about how they should study. And this week is a particular favorite of mine uh, for lots of reasons. One is that it goes back a little bit uh, into our own family's history, uh, but also because some of my thoughts have really evolved and changed in the 10 years since I first uh, recorded this message and thousands of people have watched it. But I think a lot has happened in that decade and I wanted to share some of that with you today. Now, I say that the reason there's some family history to this idea of it's not fair, which is what we want to talk about today, is that many, many, many years ago, when our daughter, who is now a member of the bar and very successful and part of our editorial team, uh, but when she was uh, just a, a little kid, uh, she would uh, always come to us as her parents uh, when she saw something that seemed particularly unpleasant or unfair when it was happening to her or more often somebody else, one of her friends at school, or whatever she happened to see. And uh, she would come to us and she'd say, it's not fair. And she would say it with great uh, earnestness and uh, she really meant it. Now, this happened to be her favorite expression, I would say, from the time she was eight or nine years old, probably for all of her life. Uh, she would say, it's not fair. And it became so pervasive that finally we just shortened it to saying, why don't you just say INF? And that's what she'd do. She'd walk in and say INF and then walk out of the room. <laughs> that was high school. Uh, and as she got older and uh, got into college and then uh, later as she went into law school and she learned that everything around her was not fair, um, she got to the point where she said, I don't even want to go through INF. Just, uh, you know, I'm just going to tap you right here, you know, a button, the uh, it's not fair button. And that'll let you know that um, I think something's not fair. And she'd walk away without saying a single word. So she'd walk in and she'd come up to me and she'd go, boom, <laughs> and she'd walk away. <laughs> now, what does all that have to do with a myth about the bar exam? Well, each year, twice a year, as results start to come out, uh, we obviously see more and more people over the last 10 years who are failing the exam. And I think it's a perfectly legitimate question for those people to ask, why is that happening and is it fair? And is it a true reflection of my work and my ability? And for a lot of people, when they fail, the results seem, I think fairly so, arbitrary and to them deeply unfair. Now, in lots of other places, I've posted videos about why people fail the bar exam. And we go into a lot of depth about what can cause failure on the test. And if you're interested, by all means, uh, check those out. But sometimes we get a student who does everything that they're supposed to do. They put in all the effort, they follow all the techniques, they do everything that we would ask of them, but they still don't pass the exam. And they'll say to me, why did that happen? And then very often with some uh, uh, frequency, they'll say, it's not, it's just not fair. Well, the myth that I want to look at today is this myth about fairness and what is fairness and is the bar exam fair and is it graded fairly? Now, there's a couple of different levels to this discussion and for many years I only talked about the superficial levels of fairness and equity and I still want to talk about those today, but at the end I'm going to talk a little bit deeper about what I think is systemic uh, fairness or lack of fairness in the system. But when it comes to whether or not your test is graded fairly, I would say that that is an urban legend, that the bar examiners somehow know more about you when they're grading the exam and they use that information against you. Let me give you an example. I got an email uh, once from a student, a foreign trained attorney who didn't pass uh, the New York exam. And the student said, uh, I'm okay with the fact that I didn't pass. I think I can do better. But then they went on to say, I'm really concerned because it seems to me that foreign trained attorneys don't do well on the exam and it's not fair. And I think the examiners treat us differently. And I've heard that sentiment many times from many different people. And I understand that frustration. And to some extent, I think there's some accuracy in that. Foreign trained attorneys absolutely do not do as well on the bar exam, whether we're talking about New York or California or Texas or Georgia with their foreign trained attorneys or any state that allows foreign attorneys to, to take their test. Foreign attorneys, uh, I would describe uh, as including uh, students and attorneys from Puerto Rico who are allowed to sit for the Florida exam. They have a much lower pass rate. It's a statistical reality. What's not accurate, however, I think, 
is the notion that the examiners take the tests, they take your essays, your performance tests, even the multi-state exam, and they set it apart. They put it in a different pile and they say, oh, here's a test from a foreign trained attorney. Let's grade that differently. Let's give it a, uh, a different application and a different uh, lens to look at it. Um, I think sometimes the view is that, that those tests might be graded more strictly. Uh, they're giving less weight to the work that's done or less credibility to the work because it's coming from someone who's a foreign trained attorney. And I think we could even uh, broaden that to say uh, a minority applicant. Now, if you read the bar examiner's literature, if you look at their internal publications and their monographs and magazines, if you go to their conferences uh, and you follow that in any format, I think what you'd see is that it's absolutely untrue that the examiners in any jurisdiction that I'm aware of have made any systemic formalized effort to do anything other than to have blind grading. I trust the integrity of the bar examiners, and I think this is really the point here, is that if you don't believe they're being fair, then they don't have integrity. And I believe that while I, I disagree with a lot of what the bar examiners do, I think they have integrity. I think that what I want to be clear about here is that the grader, the reader of an essay, has absolutely no idea whose essays or whose performance test that they're looking at. The multi-state, as you know, is a machine scored test. You bubble in answers on a Scantron sheet, it's fed into a machine. The machine obviously has no idea. The statistical models, the mathematical models of passing and failing are blind. Now, the cutoff scores are set by the bar examiners for everyone, and I think it is likely to be true that there are quotas in place that say only a certain number of uh, applicants will be accepted, and based on that, we may see some movement overall of the scoring, but it's not individually based. That is, they're not looking at a particular applicant and trying to do something specific. In other words, there's no opportunity uh, in the process for a single individual with subjective experience to say this individual applicant passes or this applicant fails based on gender, race, age, creed, background, anything of the sort. The point, I suppose, would be that if you really thought that the examiners weren't being fair, you would look to the character and fitness application uh, for that state's exam, and that certainly is a place where I think you might see some evidence of bias. For years, people have talked about the difficulty of the character and fitness application in Florida. Is there a bias there against minorities or against uh, applicants from Puerto Rico? Well, I think you could make that case, but it shows up there and not in the bar exam itself, not in the test itself. When the examiners talk about testing, uh, they're actually using uh, a form and a term called a reliability indicia. And what they mean by that is how reliable or how accurate are the tests uh, statistically over a number of years. Well, when we dig in a little bit to that reliability indicia, what we see is that the multi-state exam has a reliability index of 0.90. Now, what that means is that it's 90% accurate to determine success or failure on a consistent basis over a long period of time. And as we talk about the, the multi-state exam, we're coming up close to 50 years now of exams. So that's 100 administered exams, a lot of data points, a lot of information. And generally speaking, you should view that as good news. The problem, however, is that when you get to written work, in order to get to a 90% reliability, that same level of reliability that we have on the multi-state, if you're talking about a 30-minute essay, you'd actually need 30 essays to reach the same reliability indicia. So, uh, in a one-hour essay, you'd need 15 or 16 of those tests. And of course, there are no jurisdictions, at least none that I'm aware of, that give that many essays. Why? Well, it's not feasible. It's not timely. It's difficult to do. It would be very, very difficult uh, to do that, even though it would give us a better uh, indication of an applicant's ability, much better than six essays or three essays, uh, which is what most jurisdictions have, or even 12 in Texas. So what happens? Well, the examiners say we've got fewer tests and we have to extrapolate from the ones we've got. And this is even more so uh, when it comes to a performance test. You would need hours and hours and hours of performance tests to reach that 0 0.90 reliability. And of course, on state multiple choice tests in exam jurisdictions like Texas or Florida, uh, you'd need an awful lot of questions and a lot of psychometric evaluation. And frankly, those states don't do it and no states do it that I'm aware of. 
So as a result, the reliability of the state part of your exam, regardless of what state you're taking, and this would include the UBE, that reliability is much lower than the reliability of the multi-state. So how do we compensate for that? Well, the states that recognize that problem generally say uh, that what they're going to do is to give a higher weight to the multi-state or at least a 50% weight in the overall score to the MBE. And that's true in the UBE as well. So it's 50% of your score in the, the uniform bar exam. And in other states that use this 50 percentile rating, which now include California and Florida, Georgia, um, we use something called an equi percentile index. And what's done here is that the examiners take all the machine scored MBE scores and they put them in a list from top to bottom. And they take the best scores at the top down to the worst scores and they put them on the same measure. And then they take the best scores to the worst scores in the other parts of the exam, the essays or the performance test, and they line them up and give them the same score. So if the best multi-state score is a 180, uh, the best uh, essay score in a jurisdiction will then automatically also get a 180. And the reason that that's done that way is that it helps to make sure that whatever the breakout of scores look like on the reliable on the reliable test, the MBE, that's going to become the standard for how we grade or scale essays or performance tests in the state part of the exam. And if your eyes have blurred over just a little bit there, I don't blame you. The point I really want to make is that the examiners go out of their way to make that grading process as fair as it can possibly be made without giving you 15 or 30 essays to take. And the point I want to make about all of this, because it may sound like it's a lot of bar exam voodoo, is that the examiners really go out of their way, in my view, to be fair about this part of the process. So that brings us back to our initial question. Why do people who come from foreign countries or are minorities or are uh, older or come from uh, different uh, educational backgrounds have a lower pass rate? Well, the answer is generally they don't get the same kind of education, the same opportunities. Certainly for foreign trained attorneys, uh, they may have language problems and they may also, and typically do, have a challenge with familiarity with American law. A lot of folks have learned very different writing styles uh, if they were trained abroad or if they went to inferior law schools. Um, I would tell you, for example, that students from the UK, though English is certainly their native language, they're far too wordy. Uh, I've been accused of that myself. Uh, but uh, a UK lawyer is generally too formal. Um, I would say that there are essays uh, that come from people who are Spanish speakers that clearly indicate difficulty with grammar and language. The same is absolutely true with Asian speakers. Um, we see this constant pattern of an inability to communicate effectively under time conditions because of language constraints. And the examiners, um, you know, are not idiots. They're not blind to what they see on the page in front of them. They can obviously tell if English is not your first language. Um, but I haven't seen enough evidence over 25 plus years of the bar exam to believe that uh, for poor grammar alone, a student who would otherwise pass would fail the exam. Now, if grammar and language and spelling get in the way of understanding, then yes, it is going to hurt you. But if you can communicate uh, your thoughts, even with less than ideal grammar, you can be successful on the test. I've seen some pretty poor grammar from American trained law students uh, for whom English should have been their first language. Uh, and I don't think that it's really the dominant factor here. But I do think that what happens is that it raises the awareness of the reader that the applicant might be coming from somewhere else or might not be a traditional third year law student from a, a top 25 or 30 law school. And that raises a red flag and that's always a challenge and potentially a problem. But the truth is that if you've done the work and you've done the writing properly, if you're following a writing style like the one that we teach um, and you're using the right techniques, you're not trying to uh, fake the examiners out as we talked about in uh, uh, bar exam myth number six. If you're using uh, consistent reasoning based on the law, then it doesn't matter a whole lot what the language looks like or how many words you're using. Um, and of course, it helps that if it's understandable and legible. Um, I've sometimes had, uh, again, not to pick on our friends from Great Britain, but I've had uh, students that use the English, British spellings of uh, English words. And it's very quaint, uh, but it is a real uh, tell, to use the poker term, of someone who's not from the US. And does that help you? Well, I don't think it does, but it doesn't hurt probably as much as many of you think. And I don't think it matters very much in the scoring. 
I guess what I'm really trying to say is that I don't see any consistency or correlation between grammar and language to a certain level and results on the exam. It certainly doesn't make any difference on the multi-state exam. That's a machine scored uh, test. So I would tell you that while I'd like you to Americanize and level up everything you do uh, so that it looks like you went to law school and studied in Tallahassee or Sacramento or Albany uh, and you've lived your whole life in those towns or wherever the exam is being given, at the end of the day, that really doesn't matter as much as the quality of the work you do. And that means uh, work that's legible, certainly, but that's well organized, that marshals the law in support of arguments, that uses the law appropriately, that is clearly and easily uh, followed and uh, by design, easy to bring the reader along with you. I think if you do all those things we've been talking about in this series of videos, uh, or if you're in our course, the things that we talk about all the time, you're really going to be in a position where you have a chance to pass, regardless of your background, regardless of your circumstances. But I think that the reason that this myth can be so damaging is that basically, if you think the examiners are out to get you, that they've spotted you, that they're already looking for you to be unsuccessful, then you're already going in, I think, with one arm tied behind your back. I think you've already put yourself in a position where you're defensive and not giving your best work. And I think sometimes that becomes a hindrance to people. And in fact, it can become a, uh, a wall to really dealing with the real problems that might lie behind that. So what's my view today about the, what the bar examiners are doing? Is there fairness and equity in the system? Well, I think it's obvious that we're talking about with the bar a protective trade organization first and foremost. And secondly, that there continues to be a surplus of lawyers in the United States. And certainly in popular jurisdictions like Florida, Texas, California, New York, way too many lawyers uh, for the population. Now, that's a bad combination, and since 2008, uh, we've seen a steady decline in the number of new lawyers who have been admitted to the bar around the country in virtually every jurisdiction. I would say that's a more important factor to consider, but it would be naive to ignore the disparity in admissions in those jurisdictions for minority candidates, for non-traditional candidates, for foreign applicants. So the question remains, does the bar exam process treat those candidates differently or fairly? And I would say that to the extent that grading is both machine scored on the MBE and blind scoring is used for essays and performance tests, that is, the grader only sees one of your essays or your performance test and they do not know who you are and they don't know what your other scores are, uh, the answer is that, uh, in fact, uh, it is blind scoring. But are the readers aware that they might be reading the work of a foreign applicant or the work of someone that was trained uh, less effectively and has less writing skill? Well, sure, I think that's absolutely there. And I think in the case of uh, some jurisdictions like California, it is implicit uh, based on the number of essays that a grader is given, whether or not that applicant has done well on the MBE and deserves a careful reading of their work or uh, deserves a cursory reading because there's no way their written work can overcome their low multi-state score. Now, some states like Georgia are just straight up about that and say, if you don't reach a certain threshold on your multi-state, we're not reading your essays at all. I think that's a more honest way of approaching it. But the reality is that even in a state like California, they at least read your essay, even if the grader may have some uh, sense that perhaps you're not a passing applicant overall. I think that the deeper question here, the more important question, is to look systemically at the educational opportunities and the accessibility of high quality bar review courses for the underserved minority population, foreign trained attorneys, uh, people who are second career students, uh, applicants who come from a variety of different backgrounds. And I think that the argument there might be better made that the system overall is unfair. I think that the bar exam and bar review traditional system rewards those traditional big box students uh, who come from traditional big box law schools and have traditional big box backgrounds. And it leaves those in non-traditional settings, like the second career student, like a minority, like a foreign trained attorney, it leaves those groups to fend for themselves to secure one of the few remaining spots that are open for new attorneys in each bar exam season. And so that's a major reason behind our motivation here at Celebration Bar Review to bring high quality bar review to people who want and need to get their life back, who want and need to pass the bar and want to move on to the real work of practicing law. And while we can't bring fairness and equity to the entire system, 
We can, and we do, and we have for over 25 years, changed lives and in the process, changed communities. I'm very, very proud of the work that our students have done as members of the bar and the way that they continue to give back and contribute and serve. And we're very, very pleased to see that happen and grow. Now, if that makes sense to you, regardless of who you are, if you think that you deserve an equal chance to pass the bar with everyone else and you want the kind of quality bar review and preparation that will give you that chance, then instead of saying it's not fair, I think the better thing to say is let's dig in, do the work, and make the next bar exam your last bar exam. And when we do that, I think you have an equal chance to pass the bar and we know that that's fair.